All right, <coughs> let's begin. Um, homework 11 is on Blackboard right now. Um, that was introduced in the recorded lecture from Friday's class. It's due on Wednesday, and those are some problems I think uh, you'll be able to knock out with some pretty quick turnover. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, there's eight of them. Does anybody remember? Yes. Eight, yeah. So there's eight, but they're small. So you're getting a lot of points relative to the amount of time I think it's going to take you for that assignment. Um, and then two weeks after that is the project being due. So hopefully you're making good progress on that. Uh, regarding the exams we had last week, I'm almost finished with those. I'll probably post the grades this evening when I finish scoring the last problem. And then I'll return the papers to you in class on Wednesday. So we're going to begin or continue talking about inflation, which is in chapter 14 of our book. Uh, does anybody have any schedule-related questions before we move on? All right. This is a graph from the last 25 years, 24 years of the uh, in, uh, unemployment rate in the United States. And it's interesting to try and tie this figure to world events that you know about. So think about unemployment is when people who were previously working suddenly find themselves out of work. And the federal government keeps track of it because, um, you know, people who are not working will file for unemployment insurance, which is just kind of a, a small payment that can kind of tide you over till you get your next job. And it's also important because it's a, ref it's a reflection of the health of the economy because if companies are doing poorly, then they don't need workers and then they'll lay them off. So if you look at this figure, do you remember what happened here to cause a sudden spike in unemployment? COVID. Yeah, it was the COVID pandemic. So that one's kind of in our recent memory. And uh, you can see it got almost as high as 15% but then it came down pretty quickly. What about this one? Do you remember this spike in unemployment? Recession. Housing crisis followed by recession, yeah. So back in 2006, 2007, there was a speculative bubble on uh, house prices. And the reason for that, I mean, there's a couple of movies actually that talk about it. The Big Short is maybe one of the best, but um, Throughout the 2000s, banks got pretty relaxed with their lending standards, and they would give people a loan to buy a house, even if it was clear that they couldn't cover the cost of that loan. And the, no, the, the loans took on the nickname liar loans, because you didn't actually have to prove your income. You just had to say that you had a certain amount of income, and then they'd approve the loan. Now, it wasn't every bank. But it was enough of them that it kind of drove up asset prices because people were buying homes that they couldn't actually afford. So there was more demand for housing, and it brought the, the, the price of housing high. And then when it suddenly crashed because people started to default on their loans, then all of that uh, artificially inflated demand and artificially inflated prices for housing suddenly crashed. And then when there was suddenly so much less demand for housing, it put a lot of builders out of business. It caused a, uh, a big reduction in the amount of consumer spending. And it kind of triggered a period of unemployment and recession. And you'll notice that the, uh, the recession, the financial crisis and the recession took a much longer period to uh, decline than it did after the COVID pandemic. Um, this one's probably much too old for you to remember, but this was a uh, speculative bubble that was related to the dawn of the internet and a lot of companies were starting to sell things online there was a big um, run-up in the prices of some pretty questionable companies uh, one of the classic examples was there was some company that just sold pet food online and just all you had to do was say that you were doing a business online and people would buy the stock just kind of blindly without really considering whether the company was profitable or had any likelihood of success. And so there was a, a shorter period of unemployment and recession related to the uh, internet crash, shorter compared to this great recession and the 
financial crisis that followed it. So unemployment rate is a pretty important uh, indicator of the economy's health, and not every central bank focuses on the unemployment rate. The United States, the central bank has two missions, to control inflation and to work towards what's called full employment. And full employment doesn't mean 0% unemployment rate. What's typically understood, full employment is anything 5% unemployment and below. And so the, the thinking is that it's pretty natural and healthy to have a certain percentage of people who aren't employed because maybe they're between jobs or maybe they're truly incompetent and you wouldn't want them in, uh, in the workplace. So maybe they have a mismatch of skills or mismatch of attitude that makes them unemployable. So um, it's considered pretty normal and healthy to have unemployment 5% plus or minus a little bit. You know, too much lower than 5%, then uh, it drives up wages, and that can be good for workers, but maybe tough for companies. And you'll notice that lately, in the last few years, the unemployment's been pretty significantly below 5%. So the uh, Federal Reserve's been meeting its targets when it comes to uh, full employment in the economy. It's been struggling a bit more until recently when it comes to inflation. So there's a couple of terms it's important for us to understand, and this is you know, important for engineering, computer science, just basically anybody who's going to be working for or running a company. Um, an economic bubble is defined as a period of time when asset prices exceed any reasonable estimate of their value. So the, the housing crisis that was stimulating this period of unemployment and economic difficulty, that was a, a housing bubble, just where money was being given out without um, enough discipline, and that drove up the prices of housing. So it was a housing asset bubble. The internet asset bubble was just stocks. You know, stocks were being overvalued relative to the underlying profitability of the companies. And this economic challenge wasn't necessarily a bubble. It was a pandemic. But bubbles are important to understand because we're going to be talking about deflation today, which is one of the scariest things uh, that in, uh, ec economists worry about. Um, a recession is defined as a period of economic decline where uh, there's a fall in the gross domestic product in two successive quarters. And so we're accustomed in the United States and most other countries just to have constantly increasing um, economies. Economies that are growing, where profits are going up, where consumer demand is increasing, and the gross domestic product, GDP, is just a measure of how productive an economy is. It's the sum of all the value of uh, items being bought and sold, the value of services that are provided. And so it's, you, you can think of it as how much money is changing hands in a year in a given country. And so if that goes down, if the money changing hands decreases in two successive quarters, then that's a clear indicator that the, uh, the economy is in recession. Recede just means stepping back. So rather than growing, it's declining. So there's an important relationship between recessions and unemployment. So periods of unemployment typically occur in response to a recession. And oftentimes, recessions are caused by an economic bubble of some sort. So it's important to think about the relationship between, uh, sometimes economic bubbles are referred to as excessive exuberance, where people are just excited about some new technology, or some new investment, and the excitement exceeds the actual value of the thing. So there's a classical example from hundreds of years ago in, um, in Holland. There was a craze with tulips. Just for whatever reason, people thought, like, tulips are amazing. We got to cash in on these tulips. And so, like, the, the, uh, the price of companies that were growing and selling tulips went super high and then there was just a crash. And it caused, a, you, it's silly to think about it, that like there was a, um, an economic downturn that was caused by speculative buying and selling of tulips and tulip stocks. Um, can you think of anything nowadays that there might be a bubble related to? 
for sure, AI. People are thinking, ah, AI is the next big thing. And, you know, probably it is. It probably is a big thing. But a bubble occurs when people are investing more than they should. Like when there is more spending and more asset price increase than the profitability is justifying yet. So like back in the early 2000s, there was all this craze about the internet. And that was fully justified because eventually internet commerce became really important and profitable. But the crash and the asset like appreciation for the internet bubble was in 1999 and 2000. But a lot of internet companies like Amazon didn't actually become profitable until a full decade later. Like it, it's only in the last 10 years that Amazon has been a profitable com uh, company. I don't remember exactly what year it was, but I think it was around 2013, 2014 when they finally started having more revenue than expenditures. And so, you know, maybe AI will generate a lot of the excess profits for companies, but so far it's possible that that's a speculative bubble. Can you think of another thing that there might be a bubble with? Cryptocurrency. Very good. Yeah, cryptocurrency. I remember um, I learned about cryptocurrency reading an article in the New York Times back in probably 2011. And back then, individual people could mine their own cryptocurrency just with a normal computer. And so I started doing it. And I mined a little bit of cryptocurrency and then I kind of got bored, forgot about it. And I had, you know, I knew how much I had in a wallet somewhere. But I mean, it was worth at the time like maybe five or six dollars a coin. So it wasn't even worth really selling it to get the money out. Uh, and then I remember one day just checking the uh, cryptocurrency balance and suddenly it was worth way more than it had been in the past. Like it was enough where like I could maybe buy a used car with my cryptocurrency. And I was thinking, wow, a free used car. Um, I didn't, you buy the used car. I, I kind of just frittered it away on, you know, like um, silly things. Like I donated some cryptocurrency to a podcast. I, tra I just sent some to my brother just to show him, hey, look, there's this online money. So I don't have much left anymore, but it's worth a lot more than it used to be. And now I'm glad I, I, ha I kept a little bit of it at least, but um, the price goes up and down a lot. So, you know, like in any 12 month period, the value of a Bitcoin may go from 70,000 down to 20,000 or even less. So it's really um, volatile. And what makes it partly volatile is that it's not being used in the way that it was originally envisioned. Like people thought it was going to be an actual means of payment. But you've probably never bought anything with cryptocurrency. You've probably never paid any of your friends with cryptocurrency. You've never done a microtransaction where people were saying in the early days that, you know, you'd read something on Reddit. And if it was a funny article or a useful thing, you could give them like a tenth of a cent micropayment. And then, you know, like somebody who wrote an article and got a million micropayments could actually make their living off of that. But it just it hasn't panned out. It's just a store of value, but not really a, a means of exchange. So a lot of people think of cryptocurrency as being overvalued and a bubble. I guess time will tell if it does become anything other than, you know, like gold as a store of value, but it's not an effective means of exchange, really. Um, this is a figure that shows the other thing that the Federal Reserve Bank is uh, really interested in besides unemployment, and that is inflation. So inflation is the blue line. And no, I'm sorry. Yeah, inflation is the blue line. And then the green line is the uh, interest rate that the Federal Reserve Bank sets to loan money to other banks. And so um, inflation happens for a lot of reasons. Um, it could be that there's more money in the economy. So people have more money than they used to. And so they're bidding up the prices of things. Inflation could be caused by supply, supply chain issues where suddenly there's a shortage of something. Like you probably remember a few years ago, you'd drive by a car lot and there'd be hardly any cars there. Like I remember going over, driving past the Subaru dealer on Route 60 and they had maybe like three cars in the parking lot. It was totally a ghost town. Same thing with the Toyota dealer over by the mall. They had hardly any cars simply because of supply chain issue meant that the demand uh, was much, much higher than the supply. And so then that 
caused or maybe reinforced the inflation that was occurring. So one of the tools that the Federal Reserve has for decreasing inflation is they'll raise interest rates. So they're intentionally trying to raise interest rates to make borrowing more expensive, slow down the economy a little bit, and decrease prices. So probably the period of the most scary inflation that people were really focused on for an extended period of time was in the early 1980s when inflation, remember inflation is the blue line, inflation was high approaching 15 percent for a long period of time for several years. And so it's the area under the curve that you can think of as pain because the area under the curve is the intensity of inflation which is the height of it and then the horizontal axis is time and so the area under the curve is just the total amount that prices have gone up whereas the inflation we've experienced recently I mean it's significant it caused a real effect for a lot of people but the area under the curve for our recent inflation is just uh, a tiny fraction of what happened in the early 80s so generally the uh, economists think that uh, a healthy amount of inflation is about 2%. So they're aiming for 5% unemployment, plus or minus a little bit. 2% inflation is what they consider sustainable and healthy. And they don't want it to be too close to zero because if it's too close to zero and dips down into the negative range, when the inflation actually decreases and they have deflation, that is a really scary thing. So they, they'll aim, I mean, neutral would be zero. But they're so scared of deflation that they say, well, let's take it a little bit above the line so that we don't have these periods of deflation. We'll talk about why deflation is scary in a couple of minutes. Well, we'll talk about it right now. So this is a picture of people standing in front of the unemployment office. You know, um, if you have a job and you're making like $2,000 a month at your normal job, if you are laid off and go for unemployment insurance, you'll maybe get $500 a month. So like, it's not enough that you just throw the money away or you, know, you wouldn't ignore um, unemployment insurance, but it's a not enough that you'd wanna live on it or try to live on it long term. So that's just to help bridge the gap a little bit. Now, deflation is defined as a decrease in prices. So think about most of the things that we buy, we can just expect that in the future it's going to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions to that. But in general, your whole life probably you've just instinctively known that in the future costs are going to go up a little bit. And we don't get too bent out of shape about it as long as it's a slow progressive process. What it means is that um, if deflation is happening, if the prices are actually decreasing, then that means that your money is becoming more valuable. So it's kind of turning on end everything that we've been talking about this semester about the time value of money. Remember our normal discussion about the time value of money is that money in the future is less valuable than money today. And so that gives you an incentive today to spend the money, to invest, you know, to take some sort of positive action today. But during a deflationary period, instead of things being more expensive in the future, they're getting cheaper. And so think about if most of the things that you were buying were going to be cheaper in the future, you might be tempted to put off your purchase until later. Because the longer you wait, the cheaper the thing is going to get. So like, that is kind of what happens with computers. Like Computers are always getting better in the future. And so you can think of it as, you know, for a certain amount of money you're willing to spend, then the, either the capabilities will be greater in the future or um, the thing that you want to get, whether it's like a graphics card or memory or a screen or something, it's probably going to be a little bit cheaper in the, fu in the future. So, you know, if you look at discussion boards or just talk to people about their computer purchases, they're sometimes thinking, well, I'll wait till the next processor comes out and then that's going to drive down prices on everything else. And so it kind of, in a way, causes people to procrastinate their spending. When they do that on an economy-wide basis, it can cause what's known as a deflationary spiral, which is really uh, pretty scary for companies and workers and everybody else, investors, because of it being a self-reinforcing cycle. So in this deflationary cycle, what happens is, 
let's just start with falling demand. Demand might fall if you knew that things were going to be cheaper in the future. Like if you were going to um, book a vacation to Disneyland, but you thought next month it's going to be 5% cheaper than it is now, you put it off to the future because things are going to be cheaper. And if most things in the economy are getting cheaper over time, demand would fall just because people are putting it off just to see if it falls further. And um, remember the price versus demand relationship we've talked about. If demand goes down, then suddenly retailers are going to try and boost demand by reducing their prices because that's the only real lever that they've got. So demand went down, the retailer starts to panic, and they're trying to uh, get people in the store instead of their competitor store. So they're going to lower prices even more. And then what that does is it puts pressure on product suppliers, where if Walmart has lowered prices and no longer will pay its suppliers the same amount that it used to, then the companies that are selling all of those things they're making less revenue and so there's going to be more default on loans and so debt defaults just means that companies which have received less revenue can't make the payments that they've agreed to back in the past and um, those companies which can't pay their debts are going to have to declare bankruptcy and if there are bankruptcies and cost-cutting measures that are being undertaken that means that some of the employees who are previously employed are going to be laid off because there's less demand, you don't need as many workers if you're making less stuff. And if there's layoffs, then that means there's this big pool of unemployed workers who are willing to work cheaper because if there's plenty of laid off workers, you, you can reduce your wages and see, well, some people maybe would leave if you reduce from 12 to $10 an hour, but you'll still get to keep enough employees if you reduce your wages. And if there are reduced wages and more unemployed people, then that further reinforces falling demand. So I think you could see how this is a spiral, a self-reinforcing spiral that constantly is, um, is making the economy uh, less productive. Because remember, we are in an environment where we expect prices to be going up for you know, there to be more GDP year after year. And so during the even short periods where deflationary spirals kick in, can be really damaging and discouraging and cause a lot of uncertainty in the economy. So it's bad for workers, it's bad for investors, it's bad for profits and companies. So uh, we talked in the recorded lecture from Friday's class about how we take into account inflation when we are calculating interest rates. And uh, companies like, uh, banks, when they are offering a loan or when they are offering deposit services, they just tell you how much interest they're going to pay. But what you have to know in the background is what the inflation rate is to be able to understand what's the real rate of return that you're earning. So this formula was introduced from the Friday's lecture. And so what the, um, what the company is offering is I sub F. The inflation adjusted interest rate is what a bank is offering to you. And inflation is F. That's what's just happening in the background because of changes in demand, changes in money supply. So we don't have any control over inflation. And even the central bank only has limited control over inflation. So if I sub F is what a bank is charging or offering, depending on whether it's a loan or a deposit account, then I, the real rate of return, is what you have to know in order to determine whether um, you have an increase or a decrease in your purchasing power. So this figure is showing just from 1987 to 2006 how there was a generalized decline in the market interest rate that was offered by banks. So it's showing several different products here. It's showing like a six-month certificate of deposit in yellow. In blue, it's showing a one-year certificate of deposit. And uh, CDs, you generally will make a better rate of return on a CD than you will just a normal savings account because you're making a commitment to the bank to leave your money there for a certain period of time. So if they can invest it in longer-term, more profitable projects, 
then they can in turn give you a larger share of the, uh, of the profits. So normally, well, all of the case, a money market or just a uh, ordinary typical savings account would be much lower than CDs. But what this shows is that the market interest rate went down during those years. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank has this figure which shows how the real interest rate went down over time. So remember, real interest rate is I. Market interest rate is I sub F. So this figure on the right, the upper right figure, that is the market interest rate figure. The figure below is the real interest rate. And you'll notice that occasionally it's been dipping into negative territory. So anytime inflation is bigger than the uh, market interest rate, then your real rate of return is negative, which means actually your purchasing power is decreasing over time. And that's really discouraging for um, depositors to have their purchasing power decrease over time. Now, um, if banks are paying a market interest rate, they're very rarely going to tell you what the real interest rate is, partly because it's hard to put your finger on at any given time what inflation is, and it changes daily, and we usually don't know about inflation until a couple of months later after we've gathered a lot of data. But the point is that banks may be offering you a market interest rate that is more than inflation, and if so, then that means the purchasing power will increase over time, and your real rate of return is positive. Um, but occasionally, banks are going to be offering you a market interest rate that's less than inflation. And if they do, then that means that your purchasing power decreases over time because the real rate of return is negative. Part of the reason is they, uh, they don't know exactly what inflation is, but then they also don't want you to see how little your real rate of return is because um, you know, if, if you're aware of that, you may choose to deposit less at a bank if, if you know basically that if we look back at this other table, for a lot of the last decade, the real rate of return was below 1%. And it's really hard to get ahead. You know, why would you put off spending to the future if you're only earning a 1% real rate of return? It kind of just takes the, uh, the wind out of a lot of people's sail when they have such low yield on their savings deposits. So if we're trying to understand um, the effect of inflation on future profits or future costs, there are two main ways that we can account for inflation when we're doing an economic analysis that's looking at money in the future. One approach is just to convert all of the cash flows into constant value dollars using the inflation rate. So for example, if you know that you're going to have to buy lumber in the future, then what you do is you'd figure out what is the present value of your expense for lumber in the future. And you'd, you'd find out the present value by discounting those future expenses at the inflation rate, F. And then when you are going to calculate, for example, your rate of return, then you'd use I, the real interest rate, in calculating the future amounts uh, related to that. So it's kind of a combination of uh, accounting for costs with inflation and then determining your profits using the real interest rate. So that's one approach. And then the other is just to use the inflated dollars in the future and then use the inflation adjusted interest rate when you calculate future amounts. So we're going to get some practice with both of those in the in-class exercise for today. Um, capital recovery is uh, an important thing we've talked about several times. It was on the exam, capital recovery. Um, the basic idea with capital recovery, remember, is that we want to annualize the difference between the purchase price and the salvage value. Purchase price means a cost, an outflow at the present. The salvage value is some lump sum inflow in the future. And we want to figure out what's the annual equivalent of the difference between the two. So because today's money is more valuable and you're going to be recovering, um, like justifying your investment today with future money that's less valuable, then you should perform capital, 
a capital recovery calculations using the inflation adjusted interest rate, I sub F. And so, you know, here is the formula for find A given P. You'd substitute I sub F into that when you're calculating the capital recovery and taking into account the effect of inflation. All right, so let me hand out these papers. Okay, two problems on this one. Um, I guess there's not too much I want to say in advance on these. I'm just going to give you a few minutes to uh, work through the calculations. I've got the solution. I'll circulate around in case you've got questions or want to uh, check your answers. And then um, I'll bring the answer up on screen as well. So this is one of those um, undesirable situations where inflation is higher than the interest rate you're earning. So let's look at what that means kind of in practical terms. If you put in $110,000 into a bank account, you'll have more dollars in the future. So you know, if, if the uh, interest is accumulating at 1.25%, then after eight years, $110,000 will go to $121,000. So it's not that you'll have fewer dollars, it's just that those dollars in the future are going to be worth less than the money that you put into it in real terms. So like if we discount the $121,000 eight years in the future back to today, at the inflation rate of 3%, then that gives us a sense for um, the consequence because the $110,000 turns into purchasing power of $95,000. So it's really eroding the, the value of the money. Even though you have more dollars, it just won't be worth as much as we would like it to be because costs are growing faster than the rate that your money is growing. So what that means is that the real interest rate is effectively negative 1.7%. And so, you know, if you're thinking that you want to have some genuine increase in purchasing power, not just like that the market interest rate is 1.25%, but if you wanted your real interest rate to be 1.25% in an environment where inflation is 3%, then that means that you'd have to look for some sort of an account or an investment that yields 4.2875%. So that's a lot more than is offered by this particular bank. So anybody have questions about that first problem? By the way, this nation's highest yield, that was a phrase that used to be used by my bank. They were bragging about the fact that they were offering 1.25%. <laughs> they called it the nation's highest yield. I mean, maybe it was, but it still, it didn't feel like very much when it was a negative real interest rate. Okay, so for the second problem, we're gonna spend $550,000 now there's no salvage value, so we basically just want to annualize that. And we're going to do it with the market-adjusted inflation rate because we want a 9% rate of return real. Inflation is 5.5%, so we have to calculate what market interest rate is required to achieve that. So 
It's going to be 14.995% market uh, inflation rate. And that's what you put into the uh, capital recovery calculations. And so it should be $164,054. All right, so with that, you've got everything you need to know to solve homework 11, which is due on Wednesday. So if you've got any questions, feel free to stop by during my office hours, and I'll be happy to help you.